Checking up on the aftermath of DART. The Milky Way is part of a much, much larger structure. An early galaxy that's similar to the Milky Way and Starship Test Flight 5 could be just around the corner. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Hello from Amsterdam. So my trip through Europe continues and uh, this week I am recording from Amsterdam. Last week I was recording from Iceland. Next week I'll be recording from home. I'm going back tomorrow. But the space news continues. And so let's get into it. First up, I want to remind you there's a pretty cool space telescope under development called the Nancy Grace Roman. This is one of the two leftover Hubble class mirrors that were supplied to NASA by the National Reconnaissance Office. They gave NASA these mirrors and NASA figured out one interesting mission would be to do this large scale survey of the universe looking far back in time, but also sort of examining a very large swath of the cosmos really trying to help pin down the exact quantities of dark matter and dark energy at different points in the universe's history. And so as construction continues for Nancy Grace Roman, most recently, they started to do a bunch of extensive tests with the mission. So they took what it's going to be sort of the outer shell, the part that goes around the mirror, and then they put it in a centrifuge. And the goal here is to, to test how much spin this whole structure can handle. They spun it up to 18.4 revolutions per minute, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for a fairly small structure that works out to about seven G's. And in fact, the entire telescope is so big, they actually had to break this into several pieces to test them in the centrifuge. So with this test complete, the next step is to do a shake test. So they're actually gonna put it onto this shake table and then make sure that it can handle the vibrations of a rocket launch. So step by step, continue to test. And if all goes well, we should see this mission fly in 2027. That's three years away. I can't wait. Examining the aftermath of DART. Back in 2022, NASA's DART mission slammed into asteroid Dimorphos. And as we say, we avenged the dinosaurs. We showed asteroids that we can reach out and strike them. And follow on observations show that this impact had fairly significantly changed the orbit of Dimorphos around the larger asteroid Didymus. In fact, it had changed its orbit by 33 minutes, taking 33 minutes less time to go around the larger asteroid. But DART is gone, it wasn't able to see the effect of its impact. And so the European Space Agency has launched its own mission called HERA. And this is going to be a follow on mission to DART. It just launched this week on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, and it's going to take a fairly circuitous route to get to this binary asteroid. But it's going to do a flyby of Mars. And when it does, it's going to do some close up observations of Deimos. And this is a way to test out the optic system. Deimos is kind of like one of the asteroids that it's going to eventually reach. Then it's going to arrive at Didymus and Dimorphos in 2026. When it does arrive, it's going to release two nano satellites. One is called Milani, and it's going to be surveying the surface of Dimorphos and also measuring the amount of dust that's still surrounding the environment. The second one is called Havantes, and it's going to do a subsurface probe of the surface of Dimorphos, try and see how the structure has changed under the surface. And what's really interesting is that Hera, the sort of the main spacecraft, it's going to autonomously move itself around the asteroid, changing its orbit depending on the different targets that it wants to analyze. So when they're done, this will end up being the one of the most studied asteroids in history. The Milky Way is part of an even larger structure. When I was in high school, I was a bit of a nerd. I know that sounds surprising, but I would sometimes on a return address, I'd put, you know, there's a cane where I live on Vancouver Island. And then I would include Earth, Solar System, Milky Way, and then I would include the local group, and then I would include the Virgo supercluster. Yes, super nerdy. But in recent memory, we've learned that the Milky Way is part of an even larger structure called the Lanakea supercluster. And so while the local group 
is about 10 million light years across, and the Virgo supercluster is about 100 million light years across. The Lanakea supercluster is about 500 million light years apart. And this is just a gigantic collection of galaxies that are gravitationally bound. But it turns out we are part of an even larger structure called the Shapley concentration. But it probably has 10 times the volume of the Lanakea supercluster. Astronomers figure this out by tracking the velocity and motion of about 50,000 galaxies in the sky and realize that they are all kind of moving together in a larger structure. And in fact, we knew about the Shapley concentration back in the 1930s when Harlow Shipley first observed it and it got the name, but we didn't realize that this whole large structure was all gravitationally bound. But it's really important to kind of distinguish what gravitationally bound one large structure, what does that really mean? Because the expansion of the universe is carrying all of these pieces and parts away from each other. Dark energy is accelerating these various chunks away from each other. And so really it's not going to hold together for a long period of time. While the local group, us, Andromeda, M33, a bunch of smaller dwarf galaxies, we are gravitationally bound and we will hold together long after everything has disappeared over the cosmic horizon. But still, you know, if there's like this gravitational influence of all these objects moving together, you know, that tells us that we're part of a larger structure in the universe. A very distant galaxy is surprisingly similar to us. Now, as we look out across the cosmos, we are looking back in time. And so it's not surprising that we see less and less mature galaxies as we look farther back in time. But every now and then we get these crazy surprises. And so a new galaxy has been discovered, I guess it's an old galaxy, but a new galaxy has been discovered called Rebel 25. And it was discovered using the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. And this galaxy was seen when the universe was only 700 million years old, which is just a fraction of its current age. And yet, take a look at this galaxy picture. You can see what looks like structure in this galaxy that's being seen this early on. And in fact, astronomers think they're seeing a hint of not just this rotating face on galaxy, but they're actually seeing an elongated central bar. They're seeing distinct spiral arms. And so it could very well be that there's a galaxy that is very similar to the Milky Way, and yet just at a fraction of the age that we are today. Webb looks at Sharon. Now normally, James Webb is looking off into the cosmos beyond the solar system, but every now and then it does look at targets closer to home. And most recently, astronomers turned Webb on Charon, which is the large moon of Pluto. In fact, Pluto and its moon Charon are considered kind of a binary object because the Barry Center, the place where they are both orbiting, is outside of Pluto. We got some great observations of Sharon thanks to the New Horizons spacecraft, and now we've learned a bunch of additional stuff thanks to Webb. So astronomers have been doing this survey world by world looking for concentrations of carbon dioxide on the surface. And they found it on a bunch of different worlds. We reported on this finding on Ganymede, on other icy objects in the solar system, and now it looks like they found it and hydrogen peroxide on the surface of Sharon. And this is always really interesting because you need a source for the carbon dioxide. And from their observations with Webb, the astronomers think that this carbon dioxide forms this just thin veneer across the top of the water ice, which is on the surface of Sharon. And like consider how cold Sharon is, the water ice is as hard as rock. They are the mountains. And then you've got this thin layer of carbon dioxide that is deposited on top. So where did it come from? Astronomers think that various objects have crashed onto the surface of Sharon over billions of years. And as they do, they excavate out material. Some of that material contains carbon dioxide. That material is released. It then freezes out, snows down, and becomes part of this layer on the surface. But then the other thing that astronomers found is this hydrogen peroxide. And again, you don't just get hydrogen peroxide. There has to be some process. And so astronomers think that the surface of Sharon is being bombarded by ultraviolet radiation from the sun, as well as cosmic rays and other high energetic particles. They are turning some of that water ice into hydrogen peroxide. So it's always just surprising how active the entire solar system is and how much these ongoing processes are still happening. 
Now, a bunch of you are gonna have concerns about the way I say Sharon, and I just wanna let you know that I got that pronunciation from Alan Stern, who is the principal investigator of the New Horizon spacecraft. That's the way he says it, he studies it. I just say it the way he says it. So if you have a problem with the pronunciation, take it up with Alan Stern. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the most interesting story of the week. And the winner this week by a landslide was the discovery of exoplanets at Barnard Star. So thank you everybody who voted. Now within 24 hours of when Space Bites goes live, we'll put the new vote onto our channel. It goes into the community tab and you can see it there, but you can also see it if you're just randomly scrolling on YouTube, you should see it pop up. And then once you've interacted with it once, then it should show it to you every week, thanks to the algorithm. But just to make absolutely sure, subscribe to the channel, click on the notifications bell, watch a bunch of our videos, submit to the algorithm. Water on the moon is much more widespread. Over the last decade, our exploration of the moon has really been about the story of water. It's funny, it's like the same story about the exploration of Mars. But in this case, thanks to India's Chandrayaan mission, we learned that there are deposits of ice at the permanently shadowed craters at the moon. And we learned from other missions that in fact, there is water mixed in with the regolith across the moon. And now, thanks to the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we've learned that those deposits of ice near the south pole of the moon extend a lot further than we had ever thought. Originally, the water ice deposits were found in the permanently shadowed craters right around the polar region. But thanks to an instrument on board the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter called the Lunar Exploration Neutron Detector, astronomers have discovered that these water ice deposits extend much further away from the poles than they thought. In fact, out to about a latitude of 77 degrees. And the way they made this observation is pretty amazing. So when cosmic rays and other high energy particles strike the moon, they can bury down below the surface of the regolith. They can hit various particles and that releases neutrons. The neutrons have to then get back through the regolith and out into space. But if the neutrons have to get through water ice first, then it changes the amount of energy in the neutrons. And so Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has this instrument on board that measures the energy of the neutrons that are being ejected from the surface of the moon and it was able to then map out. And they found that there are these deposits of water. Now we don't know exactly how much water because it can only detect within the first meter or so of the surface of the moon. But they found that in a lot of craters, there's about five liters of water mixed in in every cubic meter of regolith. And just for comparison, previous missions have found there's about a water bottle's worth of water mixed in with the regolith in every cubic meter for other parts of the moon. So it really feels like there's a lot of water up there and that's good news when we have some kind of permanent presence on the surface of the moon. They won't have to ship their water in from Earth. They can get it locally. A super compact triple star system. We know that what looks like single stars are in many cases multiple star systems. You could have two stars, three stars, more orbiting this really tight grouping. And the problem is, is that if the stars are too close to each other, then even our most powerful telescopes can't distinguish, can't pick them apart. You need high resolution to be able to see which are multiple stars orbiting around. But if stars are transiting in front of each other, then we can detect the presence of multiple stars in a system, depending on the changes in brightness of the stars. And NASA's TESS mission has been using the transit method to find planets, but it's also really good at finding transiting stars. And so astronomers found what looks like the tightest grouping of a triple star system ever found. The system consists of three stars. Two of the stars are orbiting one another every 1.8 days. And then a third star is orbiting both of those at about 25 days. And you could fit the entire system within the orbit of Mercury, three stars inside the orbit of Mercury. And this is the tightest grouping that's ever been found. It beats the previous record, which was set back in 1956 by eight days for that orbit of the outermost star. Get ready for flight five. Now we thought we were gonna have to wait for November for the next test flight of Starship and Super Heavy, but we've learned from SpaceX that they're planning to try and do a test launch as early as October 13th. That's really soon, that's like three days away. So apparently the regulatory approval came through sooner than they were expecting. And so this means that 
they've got the green light to be able to launch. So what are they going to try to do this time? Well, last time, if you remember, they launched super heavy and then returned and landed gently in the Gulf of Mexico. Starship went out into sort of a longer ballistic trajectory and landed in the Indian Ocean. So this time, they're going to try and land super heavy back at the launch tower. They're going to try and catch it with the chopsticks, the Mexilla launch platform. And then with Starship, they're going to try again to have it survive entry through the atmosphere and whatever changes they're making to their heat shielding, hopefully they, we won't watch the various tiles flare and see hot gases making their way into the flaps. So hopefully it will land safely through the atmosphere. Now, having Super Heavy land at the launch site sounds like a tall order, but apparently, according to Bill Gerstenmaier, at a recent press conference, he said that Super Heavy came within a half centimeter of accuracy of their kind of virtual landing pad out in the ocean. And so if they were able to get that level of accuracy with Super Heavy, then I guess they're ready to have it return to Mexilla and get caught. And if they're able to successfully pull this off, then there's a couple of big milestones that are still remaining. They've got to be able to have Starship successfully survive re-entry through the atmosphere. It's got to be able to land and be captured by Mexilla. And then SpaceX needs to demonstrate that they can do orbital refueling. And it's believed that for the human landing system, the version of Starship that's going to help take the astronauts down to the surface of the moon, they're going to need to pull off about 16 flights of Starship to be able to completely refuel so they can go off to the moon and be able to handle that landing on the surface of the moon. So all eyes are going to be on SpaceX in the next couple of days and we'll see what happens. Every week I write The Guide to Space, which contains dozens of other stories that we don't report here on Space Bites. And so if you want a more comprehensive understanding of the big space news of the week, definitely check out The Guide to Space newsletter. It's completely free. I write every word by myself and it goes out to about 72,000 people. You can unsubscribe anytime you want. There's no ads. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. Now I'm going to talk about our content policy at Universe Today, but first I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Matter, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Robach, scienceworldrecord.org, spiderswap.io, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Chiplin who support us at the Master of the Universe level and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I get emails every week from people who are concerned about protecting Universe Today. They found examples of Universe Today stories being copied on a variety of other websites. You might see it on phys.org, you might see it on you know, other videos here on YouTube, and people wonder, am I concerned about people stealing my content? I am not concerned. In fact, everything we create at Universe Today is provided with a Creative Commons 4.0 license, which means that you are free to do whatever you want even commercial stuff with our content. You can take all of the articles that we write at Universe Today and you can put your own website together and reprint all of our articles. You can incorporate bits and pieces of Space Bites or my podcasts, whatever you want, fill your boots, I don't care. All we ask is that you let people know where you got the content from. Give us credit and especially Give credit to the writer, the person who actually created the material. We put the writer's name very prominently on every story that we do on Universe Today. Please maintain the name of that writer so that they can help build their portfolio. And then of course, you don't have to ask me for permission. Go ahead, use our content, feel free. All right, we'll see you next week.